Hello. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce you to the proposed Sydney system for reporting lymph node cytology. And uh, this is largely based on this publication that came out in May 2020. And you can see here that it has an international authorship. So this uh, system was created by an international panel of expert cytopathologists from around the globe, and it has been endorsed by the International Academy of Cytology as well as the European Federation of the Cytology Societies. The overall goals are to improve the quality of lymph node FNAs and reporting. So not just the reporting, but also the performance of lymph node FNAs and to improve communication between cytopathologists and clinicians. Very importantly, to foster greater acceptance and utilization of lymph node FNACs and to promote better multidisciplinary understanding of the results of lymph node cytology. So the aims cover both interpretation and reporting, as well as the wider systems-based practice. In terms of interpretation, I will just read out the highlighted ones uh, to define basic diagnostic reporting categories, to provide recommendations on the components of standardized diagnostic reports. So this covers the actual writing of cytopathology reports and to provide management recommendations linked to the reporting categories. And um, on the wider view in terms of systems-based practice to provide some consensus guidelines to facilitate communication within the multidisciplinary clinical team. And very importantly, to increase lymph node FNAC reliability and clinician awareness of its diagnostic potential. We are going to look at five aspects which have all been covered in this proposal and they include pre-analytical considerations, clinical aspects, cytopathology, which describes the five categories, ancillary testing, and the FNAC report. So let's start by looking at the pre-analytical considerations. And these include indications for FNAC, so when should FNACs be done versus core biopsies or excision biopsies, who does the FNA, and some technical considerations regarding the needle size, the aspiration technique, as well as the specimen splitting or triage. Starting off with indications for FNAC, the FNAC is recommended in situations where the clinical findings are unclear or blood investigations do not explain or match the clinical context, and for staging for assessing treatment response, metastases, and eligibility for clinical trials. The FNAC alone, uh, possibly with appropriate ancillary testing, should be sufficient for confirming reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, specific infections, recurrent lymphoproliferative disease, or metastases. And uh, the authors further state that a core needle biopsy may add value and may be suggested if it can be safely performed. A larger biopsy in terms of a core needle biopsy or excision biopsy would be recommended if there is uncertainty in the FNAC diagnosis. So this is after the FNAC. Again, if the clinical context or the investigations don't match the FNAC diagnosis. And in most instances for the primary diagnosis of lymphoma, except for clinical situations or locations where histologic biopsy is not possible, for example, in a very ill patient or a very deep-seated lymph node location. Um, and this really also depends on the type of lymphoma because, for example, certain lymphoma types like chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma can be diagnosed on FNA and flow cytometry. In terms of who does the FNA, the operator, it is recommended that a cytopathologist, especially with ultrasound guidance, does the FNA. However, it is acceptable if a non-cytopathologist performs the FNA, but there is ROSE or rapid on-site evaluation. 
And the last aspect of pre-analytical considerations are the technical considerations. So for this, we're looking at the intra-procedural considerations, whether to do it under image guidance. So it is recommended that direct FNA can still be done for very obviously palpable lymph nodes, but the rest would benefit from some form of image guidance, whether it's ultrasound, CT, or EUS, EBUS guided FNAs. The needle gauge, the optimal gauge would be 23 to 27 gauge needles. Whether or not aspiration is used, uh, it is stated that the non-aspiration technique is well suited to lymph node FNAs and I agree with this. The needle only technique especially is useful for very fine motor control. For example, if there are small mobile lymph nodes or if the patients are pediatric patients or particularly anxious. And rose, of course, is recommended. In terms of the specimen triage or the division of material, expelling all material onto a single slide is discouraged. Uh, rather, a specimen splitting technique is recommended to optimize the specimen so that we can partition the material for ancillary tests, which can sometimes be required in different labs. And uh, the passes and, of course, the collection of the specimen is according to the clinical picture as well as the rose picture. Multiple passes may be needed to obtain tissue for ancillary testing, and here are some examples of how samples can be collected, cytospins, cell blocks, smears for special stains, needle rinse for microbiology and flow cytometry, etc. If the FNAC is performed by non-pathologists or there is no option of rows, then liquid-based cytology is acceptable. And however, the caveat is that there are no air-dried smears and hence pattern recognition is reduced. The other disadvantage is that flow cytometry cannot be performed. And uh, the authors also state that the operator performing the FNAC should be provided a protocol for making appropriate direct smears as well as how to rinse the needle and the syringe in buffered saline or other medium suitable for either flow cytometry or cell block preparation. Now, in terms of the clinical aspects, we can think about who is requesting the FNA. Is it from a surgeon? Is it from an oncologist? Is it from a physician? And this sometimes uh, affects the type of information that is required. The patient factors are also, of course, very important in terms of the epidemiology, the gender, the age of the patient. The risk of metastasis increases dramatically after 40 years of age, as you can see here. The location of the node, usually nodes in deep-seated regions or locations, have a higher risk of being malignant. And of course, very importantly, past history of malignancy especially, or infection. And lymph node factors also are important. The size, the larger, the more worrying. The shape, especially these red flag features as round lymph nodes or irregular shaped nodes, are suspicious for pathology. Uh, the texture of lymph nodes, whether they are hard, whether they are soft or fluctuant, and also the imaging. And again, the loss of fatty hilum is a red flag for the possibility of malignancy. And finally, of course, other investigations, uh, for example, full blood counts, uh, tumor markers, etc. Next, we are going to look at cytopathology, which covers the diagnostic categories. And there are five diagnostic categories that uh, are in this proposed system. Inadequate or insufficient, benign. AUS, which is atypical cells of undetermined significance, or ALIS, atypical lymphoid cells of uncertain significance, suspicious, and malignant. These diagnostic categories in the cytology report are known as the first diagnostic level. The second diagnostic level is basically the specific diagnosis, for example, specific infection or lymphoma subtype based on clinical and ancillary testing if this is available. So first diagnostic level is required and the second diagnostic level is recommended if possible. Let's start by looking at the inadequate category and then following that we will go category by category. For the inadequate or insufficient category, this includes cases that cannot be diagnosed due to scan cellularity, extensive necrosis, or technical limitations, very similar to other international systems for reporting cytology. And the management is to repeat the FNAC or 
to consider core needle or excision biopsy based on the specific clinical context. For the next category, this is B9, and this is where you can give a diagnosis of an infectious etiology, such as separative or granulomatous inflammation, and if possible, specific infections, and a reactive lymphoid population, for example, heterogeneous lymphoid population with a predominance of small lymphocytes, or where we can readily appreciate germinal center material. And the management, this again, very importantly, brings in the clinical picture. So if the FNAC findings are in agreement with the clinical and sonographic features, then follow-up or specific treatment is indicated. And if the FNA findings are discrepant from the clinical or imaging findings, then a repeat FNAC with ancillary testing such as immunophenotyping, uh, preferably by flow cytometry, is required. So even in a benign FNAC, it is very important to correlate with clinical and sonographic features. Now moving on to the atypical category, as mentioned, this is actually subdivided into two categories, lymphoid and non-lymphoid. Atypical lymphoid cells of uncertain significance, ALIS, this is a uh, used for scenarios where a lymphoma cannot be excluded. For example, follicular lymphoma cannot be excluded, or uh, if there are too many large cells or too many immature small lymphoid cells. Then there is the atypical non-lymphoid cells, AUS, where perhaps metastatic malignancy is not excluded. And the management is to repeat FNAC with flow cytometry and cytogenetics. This is, of course, in ALIS or to actually move on to a larger biopsy, such as a core needle biopsy or excision biopsy. Regardless of clinical or ultrasound findings, an atypical category finding should prompt further investigation with tissue biopsies. Now, the suspicious category is, uh, again, it is subdivided into suspicious for lymphoma, where the cells appear to be lymphoid and monomorphic and where cytomorphology alone is not sufficient and uh, additional ancillary test results are not available or not confirmatory, or if there is even a polymorphous appearance but there are a few large cells which one would be concerned for Hodgkin lymphoma. And again, ancillary tests are either not performed or are not helpful. And finally, any instance where the morphology points to lymphoma, but uh, there's insufficient material for confirmatory ancillary tests. Also included in this category is non-lymphoid conditions, suspicious for metastasis, for example, too few cells or insufficient uh, material for diagnostic confirmation. And the management, again, is either to repeat the FNAC with cell block and ancillary testing or to perform a core or excisional biopsy. So the management for the atypical and suspicious categories is quite similar. And the final category is malignant. Um, so this is where there are small to medium sized cells uh, of non-Hodgkin lymphoma supported by evidence of clonality, flow cytometry, molecular studies, um, or entities in which cytopathological features alone are sufficient to identify malignancy in very classical and very obvious cases, such as large cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, or even Hodgkin lymphoma if there are diagnostic cells. And this also includes, of course, metastatic malignancies. Management is histologic biopsy unless we are looking at a clinical scenario of known cases of either lymphoid or non-lymphoid malignancy, or if the patient is not amenable to histologic biopsy because of the location of the nodal mass or because of other patient factors. So here is a summary taken from Table 4 in this paper of uh, the management recommendations for each category. So inadequate, uh, non-diagnostic, repeat FNA or histologic biopsy, benign finding, really depends on the clinical findings and usually this is follow-up or specific treatment unless the clinical findings do not match and then further tissue biopsies are required. Atypical and suspicious, both followed by either repeat FNAC with ancillary testing or 
histologic biopsy. And lastly, for a malignant diagnosis, the management is histologic biopsy unless the patient has already got a known malignancy which fits clinically into the picture or if the nodes are located at particularly deep-seated sites or if patients are not amenable to surgery. Now moving on to ancillary testing, it's very important to stress that the ancillary techniques that are employed are different for every case and they depend on the clinical scenario as well as Rose findings. So immunocytochemistry is recommended if the cytologic picture shows non-Hodgkin or Hodgkin lymphoma or METS. Flow cytometry is recommended for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It is not generally recommended for Hodgkin lymphoma. However, it is acceptable to perform flow cytometry if there is a suspicion uh, or a need to exclude non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And other tests such as fish, cish or molecular tests can also be done if necessary or available. And the final element of the Sydney system is the FNAC report. So the FNAC report, of course, should include um, many standard pieces of information. But it is also recommended that where available, clinical information and ultrasound features can also be included, especially in cases which are less than straightforward. Diagnostic category, of course, cytomorphological description and the results of relevant ancillary tests or recommendations, a summary conclusion, and a final report conclusion which should include the specific diagnosis which correlates with the ancillary test results so we have here our first level of diagnosis and here the second level of diagnosis, which is the specific diagnosis um, correlating with ancillary tests and also, if available, prognostic and therapy related information, as well as, of course, further management recommendations. So here is an example of the information or the elements that comprise a cytology report. And uh, we can see here that this is the first diagnostic level and this is the second diagnostic level where the specific diagnosis is given. It is also important to note that it is helpful to actually state in the report whether or not the sample is suitable for further studies um, because this would actually facilitate ordering additional tests. And the authors actually go on to describe or to provide a list of uh, the lymphomas or lymphoproliferative disorders that are identifiable by lymph node FNAC. And if you look at this, it is essentially um, practically the entire WHO classification 2017. So this is just uh, to highlight the point that lymph node FNAC is an extremely useful test and also with the uh, increase in dependence on molecular testing, cytology is right back at the forefront in terms of providing suitable tissue for molecular testing. So let me summarize the Sydney system. We have pre-analytical considerations such as the actual indications for FNAC versus uh, core or excision biopsy, the operator considerations, ideally by a pathologist with rows, and technical considerations such as needle gauge using the non-aspiration technique and trying to maximize specimen yield by specimen splitting. And then we have clinical aspects, who is requesting the FNA. We have patient and lymph node factors and of course other clinical investigations. And we have cytopathological aspects which are the five diagnostic categories. And finally, we have ancillary testing, which includes a whole range of tests and really depend on the clinical or ROSE findings. And to tie it all up, the FNAC report, which provides the diagnostic category, the specific diagnosis whenever possible, and any additional prognostic or therapy related information, as well as management recommendations. And before I end off, let me introduce CytoWeb, which is our website which has some interesting unknown cyto cases as well as some videos on cyto preparation techniques and uh, a growing picture atlas. We also have a CytoWeb Instagram channel on which we put up challenging cases or classical cases regularly as well as some pop quizzes. Thank you.